Our tradition for living waters is to welcome our guests. This morning we have Paul and his beautiful wife Natalie. Can we give a can we stand and give a round of applause and a nice welcome to Paul as he comes up front to preach the word of God? Come on, Paul. You got a fresh filter because mine is kind of Awesome. Thank you. Lord thank Jesus, you. I thank you for Paul. Yes. I thank you for his willingness to serve yes. us this morning. Jesus. I pray your anointing over him. Yes, God. May Lord. this pulpit be a, uh, yes, ascending a moment for him. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Oh, this is good. I've just been blessed. As soon as we got here, it was just even coming into the prayer room right there and, and Really, I love that, that, that tradition, just, just that, that uh, practice of even before the service starts, just already beginning to pray over the service, right? I think sometimes when we come into even a, a worship service, and, and uh, I notice personally for myself, and, 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 and before I'd, I'd come to a service, and it's like, oh, this wasn't right, or that wasn't right, and, 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 but then once I began to pray over the ministers, pray over the singers, all of a sudden, something began to change in my heart, right, and then all of a sudden, God began to speak to my heart, even when the speaker wasn't the most eloquent, you know, speaker, and maybe not the most uh, well put together words, God began to speak to my heart, and so I just love how, how there's some prayer warriors there who had a chance to make it before service to pray, and, and, and I love how even um, hearing about just the, the great legacy that whoever knows uh, uh, Pastor David Wilkerson, uh, the great legacy that he left behind there in New York City where currently my wife and I are serving and I, I loved hearing that that actually um, during his services as he would preach there would be people in the basement praying and I think that's just so powerful how, how even here uh, to just you know, before even others come into the service, the ground's already being cultivated through prayer. And I thank the worship team that, you know, we were just all singing and continuing to just cultivate our hearts to receive from God. And it's a great privilege to be here. Uh, I, I met uh, Brother Vasily a while back during our um, As Assemblies of God uh, fellowship conference that we had. And as soon as we talked, there was like this instant connection that we had. And so uh, he invited me to, to, to join and, and come speak here a while back. But I was almost like Jonah just running from it. And then I finally, you know needed to just submit to God, and, and I really was. I was in prayer, and I was praying, and then this church came on my heart, and I was just like, you know what? So I just uh, uh, wrote uh, uh, Brother Vasily, and, and, and it's good to be here. So the main uh, uh, text that I'm going to be speaking from is recorded in Luke chapter 18. Uh, specifically, we're going to look at verses 1 through 8. So if you have your Bibles, feel free to open up with me to Luke uh, chapter 18, verses 1 through 8. And he told them a parable to show them that they ought to always pray and not lose heart. He said, in a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected man. And there was a widow in that city who kept coming to him and saying, Give me justice against my adversary. For a while he refused, but afterward he said to himself, Though I neither fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will give her justice so that she will not beat me down by her continual coming. And the Lord said, Hear what this unrighteous judge says. And will not God give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? One of the very purposes that we see to this very parable that Jesus is giving is found in the very first verse. Jesus is sharing this parable, as we read, uh, in order to show his disciples, or in other words, to, to teach or, or, or to encourage his disciples, that they ought to always pray and not lose heart. Or in other words, to not give up. 
I like how the ESV translation specifically highlights the heart posture in this. He says, to not lose heart. You know, other uh, translations will say to not give up or, or to not faint or, or, or some other good uh, translations or synonyms to, to, to the wording being used there. It could also be to not lose spirit or, or to not lose hope. But essentially, the, the meaning... It, it, there behind the very wording is, is really the same meaning there. Because uh, as we take a deeper look to, to the meaning behind even giving up, to whatever degree when a person gives up, it's connected to the heart. Or in other words, it's connected to the inner person of the individual. And when we look at even at the original Greek that, that's being used there, there's there's uh, uh, definitely a connection to the heart. In other words, to the inner person of the individual. And so as we look at this text, one of the purposes that we see behind why Jesus is sharing this parable is for one, to encourage his disciples to always pray and not lose heart. I remember back in, in, in high school, I, I played American football, and I, I loved it. And I remember during the summer uh, days when we'd have a practice, and I specifically grew up in Sacramento, California. And for those who may not be familiar with the climate there, it gets very, very hot. It gets up to like 100 degrees Fahrenheit plus some. Uh, and, 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 uh, but the coach is realizing and know, knowing that, that the, uh, the, uh, during certain times in the summer that the days get really hot, they decided to utilize these very hot summer days and actually not make one practice during uh, the summer, but two practices. They called it, it was a double practices and they even called it hell week. And, and uh, so it, it, and many people would try to avoid these practices because they were really, really difficult. But um, since my family, we didn't really grow up with the most money, I had to work a little bit during uh, the summertime. And, and I helped my cousin uh, painting houses over the summer. And so for one of the practices, I wasn't able to make it. And, and I came to my coach and, and, and I shared with him and I said, hey, I need to work. But, but I would love to come back to this practice, even on my own time, and, and do these very running drills that many people would want to try to trick their way out of it and not do them and essentially my coach excused me to go to work and um in in a way he didn't even expect me to come back and make up those practices he just said okay it's fine you can go but with nobody there to force me to go and, and and run those running drills with no one really around to see me doing them I came at a time of intense heat to do these very difficult running drills that many would avoid. Like some would, people would even begin to throw up because they were so difficult. But I still came and did them. And, and, and essentially, uh, some of my coaches noticed in me putting in that e extra effort. And they're like, okay, wow, this kid has heart. There's something different about this kid. He came where nobody was forcing them to do this to run these running drills. And uh, one of the things that, that, that really helped me to continue to work hard and uh, train during training camp was because, for one, I had faith that if I put in the work now, that when the game time comes, I'm going to be able to do other things that even some talented people later were not able to do. And so for one, it's, it's, it's faith and believing in that very process that helped fuel something within me. The second thing is, well, I simply loved the game of football. And so as a result, that helped me to have heart and, and to go the extra mile, even though no one was really even forcing me to do so. And so here in this parable, when, when Jesus ex is expressing the importance and the need to always pray and not lose heart, specifically the, the, even that language of not losing heart, that really resonates with me. Because even when my coaches spoke over me and they spoke about the importance of having heart, there's, there's something that, that, that as I read this, I'm like, Okay, Jesus is pointing at something very important in this text. And I think in order to help them to not lose heart, there, there needed to be a glimpse of hope within. 
that would help fuel the very, or, or, or give source to the very effort that they put in. There needed to be this very glimpse of hope. And I believe hope begins to arise more from, one is, is very knowing the very character of God from knowing who God is, from knowing the heartbeat of God. And that which leads me to the first point that I would like to highlight that we see in this text, that we see Jesus himself highlighting. And and, and what he's highlighting here is the importance of theology, or in other words, the importance of how we view God. When someone asks us, what is God like? What is our answer? Because how we view God will essentially reflect how we live. And and if we view God as some kind of impersonal being somewhere far away who doesn't care about our needs, doesn't care about what we're going through, well then essentially that's going to affect our heart posture. Essentially that might even affect whether we come to God in the first place or not. And so in this parable, one thing that I see Jesus doing is he's specifically highlighting the goodness of God, that our God is good. He's not like this unrighteous judge. And so our coming to God is not in vain, which essentially it gives hope to even these very disciples that Jesus is is speaking this to. There's going to come a time in their life when they're going to go through some difficult moments. When they're going to go through some trials and and, and one of the things that Jesus is doing here is he's highlighting the importance for them to not lose sight of the goodness of God. And and how we view God matters. How, How we answer the question of what God is like essentially reveals our theology. You know, there's one time in the scriptures we see that Jesus uh, asks his disciples a very important question. But he first starts off and he's saying, who do other people say that I am? And then they begin to give these other theories of, of what other people are saying, what Jesus is like. But then he turns to each and every one of them and he says, but who do you say that I am? And I believe that is a a question that that Jesus asks to each and every one of us. Who do you say that I am? It's one thing of what other people say that I am. It's one thing of what my grandparents said that that, that I am, or my parents said that I am. But who do I say that Jesus is? You know, it's interesting when we even see that scenario, specifically even in Mark, he highlights this even more, is, is where the beginning half of of the gospel of mark we see it and specifically even the way mark writes he's, it's like they call it the gospel of action he loves to highlight the word immediately right and immediately jesus goes and he heals this person and he heals that person and immediately they go to the next town and he highlights these words immediately 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 and then they, we reach chapter eight and then all of a sudden jesus is healing a blind man but he doesn't heal him immediately There was a progressive healing that took place there. And at first he begins to see people like trees. And then he needs a second touch from Jesus. And what's interesting is is, is how Mark even records certain miracles taking place. And right after that miracle, it's like there's a teaching moment that he records, Jesus giving the disciples. And that's exactly when he asked that question. He asked, who do other people say that I am? And then he turns to his disciples and says, but who do you say that I am? And then at one point, Peter's like, you're the Christ. And he's, Peter was always the guy who just like spoke for the rest of the crew of what the rest of the guys were thinking. And it's like, he, he, he says the right thing, right? But then it's interesting, once Jesus begins to share about his suffering, all of a sudden, the same Peter that was just said something right needs to be rebuked. And the same Peter at that moment was still seeing people like trees just like this blind man needed a second touch from Jesus Peter needed a second touch from Jesus and we see that later that rooster crow moment and later we see the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and all of a sudden this same Peter is like a different man he begins to see a different revelation of who this Messiah is And at that time, we see one, they seem a Messiah to be this political deliverer who's going to rescue them from all of their, 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 their political oppression or whatever they may be going through. 
they, they're, they're thinking they're going to be, they're going to take over Rome. They're going to be the ones, this, 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 these leaders of the whole governmental realms. And, and it specifically in Mark highlights this very much of that disciples were just simply not getting it yet. They needed a second touch from Jesus. The, the, their version of who this Messiah was going to be was a, a completely different Messiah than who he actually was and, and, and who he actually came uh, and what he actually came to do. And, and essentially that reflected how they lived because then we see Peter jumping in front of Jesus instead of following Jesus. And then we see Jesus saying, whoever wants to follow me must uh, take up the cross, must deny themselves, take up the cross and follow me. And it didn't really sit easy with him, but there needed to be something that, that, that spoke to their heart. And, and, and essentially, how they view God mattered because essentially that reflects how we live. Because I would say good theology is practical theology. And if there's a disconnect between our theology and how we live, or if there's a, in other words, disconnect between our belief and behavior, there's something off there. Because essentially, either way, how we live reflects our theology. In other words, if, if I'm on a cliff and I know that if I'm going to jump off of this cliff, and I'm going to die, well, I'm not going to do that. You know, and so essentially our belief, what we believe matters because essentially that fuels how we live. And, and you know, it, it, I, I noticed that in the West specifically, very often we've made knowing God just about some kind of intellectual kind of information or about some kind of head knowledge. But... When we look at the scriptures explaining the, the aspect of knowing God or, or knowing the heart of God is far from just some kind of head knowledge. The way scriptures explains this also we see that it encompasses an experiential kind of knowledge, an intimate kind of knowledge, a knowledge that touches our very heart. And in the original language, the same wording that's actually used between Adam and Eve uh, knowing each other as husband and wife is actually the same language that's used later about us knowing God. Now, yes, in a different context, but, but my point is that even through that very language, we can see that, that, that there's more than just a, a head knowledge that comes from uh, uh, truly knowing the heart of God, of, of, of having good theology, I would say. And I'm grateful for, for personally my uh, Pentecostal background that they highlight very much so that just even experiencing God, a theology that doesn't only touch the head, but touches the heart of, of the Word becoming flesh, the Word becoming alive in us that it's not just some kind of information that it's not just a, a book that I read that, that that God did not just decide to go mute when, when the Bible was canonized and or went into print but that God continues to speak to us and he can do so in various different ways I'm very grateful for that and part of getting to know God is sometimes might actually look like him inviting us, like he invites the disciples to go to the other side of the sea. And then they find themselves in a storm. And sometimes it's in that very storm that we get to know God because we see then and there as, as Jesus was taking a nap, which Jesus likes to take naps for one, good theology. Jesus likes to take naps. Sometimes it's good to take naps. But, but the, the, the second thing, what's interesting there is when they find themselves in the storm and as they churned to Jesus and, and Jesus calms the, the storms, they see the very authority that he has over those storms and the seas and, and, and the waves, how they obey him. And they're like, whoa, who is this that even the winds and the, and the sea obey him? And in this parable, we see that Jesus is highlighting that God is good, the goodness of God, that he is a righteous judge. And to convey this very uh, principle that, that, that he's highlighting here, uh, he's, he uses an, uh, an argument of, of lesser to greater than argument that, that many rabbis would actually use at that time. And Jesus being a Jewish rabbi, he's, he's using this very uh, kind of a way of teaching in order to highlight the goodness of God and the very outcome that comes from from that goodness and, and we can see that even if an unrighteous judge ends up helping this widower 
In other words, what we see in this text is how much more will God help his children? How much more will God help his church? How much more will God help those who call upon his name? In this parable, we see how horrible this unrighteous judge is. We can see how he completely does not care about this woman. Not only does he not care about her, but we could also see that he's even annoyed of her. He feels burdened by her. He even feels like he's being beat down by her, as if he's the one under oppression. And maybe even during some of her visits, maybe he was even more oppressive than helpful, but yet there's something about this woman that kept her coming that kept her coming even to this unrighteous judge. Well, and then eventually we see that this unrighteous judge helps her. And even though through the way he helps her, he was more concerned about himself than even her. But essentially, this woman still gets what she was asking for. And here we see that the point that Jesus is making is, one of the points he's making is, how much more will the father, the righteous judge, help his children who call upon him day and night. And so the first thing I'd like to highlight, for one, is that God is good. And, and, and for us to really, to never lose sight of his goodness. Sometimes it, it, there, there, there could be other obstacles or other circumstances that try to come in the way to block our perspective from seeing that God is good. And, and, and I just want to highlight, just as this parable is highlighting, that our God is not like this unrighteous judge. Our God is good. Our God is a righteous judge. He's a righteous one. He's not like the unrighteous judge. Our God does not show partiality. And no matter who calls upon him, God hears our cry. And if this woman received what she was asking from an unrighteous judge, well then how much more will we receive from the righteous one? The second thing that I would like to highlight in this parable is the very persistency that this widower is showing here. There's something that, that kept her coming. Even though her situation wasn't the best, even though this judge may have at some point have been just as oppressive as that very adversary that she's seeking justice from, I believe it was her faith that that kept her going, that kept her coming to this judge day in and day out. And I would say that it is her, the, the, the faith that actually generated the spark of hope within her, which essentially fueled her to not lose heart, coming to this judge day in and day out. And maybe even at times, I don't know what the protocol was to see this judge Maybe there was a line to even come and, and see him. And, and, but, but from this text, we see that it, was a, it took a while. It took a process. She didn't receive what she was asking for right away. But she kept coming. And there was, we see a bunch of different obstacles in the way. And I just can't help but think that, you know, how, how long maybe she would have even waited, maybe in line to see this judge. Or, or either way, she comes to him and all of a sudden rejected. And then she says, he comes again, right? And, and then again, rejected. And, and, and again, rejected. And maybe at times as she's coming to this judge thinking, okay, maybe today is going to be my day. Maybe today is going to be the day where, where the, the last become first and the first become last. Maybe today is going to be my day. And sometimes we might find ourselves in a similar situation. Or maybe there's something that we've been praying for for a while now. Maybe at times might even end, find ourselves in some form of oppression, whether that comes from somebody at work or, or as a, in a society as a whole and, or, or whatever pain that we may be going through. I, I'm very encouraged that in this text we see an invitation to keep coming to God about it to keep drawing near to him about it. And it's interesting how at the end of uh, this, this, this uh, parable in verse 8, that, that faith is highlighted. Jesus highlights faith. And he says, will the Son of Man find faith on earth? 
Sometimes we might highlight how, how great a person's faith is when we see uh, like uh, some kind of healing right on the spot, then in there, right? Or, or someone receives this quick answer. We see some like miraculous thing happening right then and there. A person prayed, healed, bam, done. And now I'm not speaking against that. And God does move in those ways at times. And it's awesome when he does. But what, what I find interesting here is that faith is actually used in a bit of a different way here. In this specific context, we see faith actually being expressed through the very persistency to keep coming over and over and over again. To continuing to keep drawing to God. Jesus is actually highlighting the very virtue of persistency in prayer. Here, the faith that's being highlighted is actually the very audacity to ask again. The audacity to keep coming back to God. And I don't know, maybe some even here in this place, when Pastor Vasily uh, called us for this corporate prayer to pray with each other, to pray, to mention specific names, and maybe for some of us, those specific names that we even mention, it, it kind of hurts to even say those names. Maybe some of those names we were hurt by. Maybe some of those names were our sons and daughters that went away from their fa the faith. Maybe husbands or wives or some individuals who, who maybe even serve as, as an uh, uh, adversary and, and bring an oppression or whatever it may be. And maybe it, it was very even difficult to mention those names. And one thing I'd like to say is that it could be easy to give up when we don't receive no answer. And maybe some of those prayers we were praying for a while now and we have not yet received some answers. And I would just want to highlight that, that one of the boldest prayers we could pray is actually some of those prayers that we've been praying for a while now and still don't re have not received an answer yet. But God invites us to just keep asking of Him. As author Mark Batterson makes a similar point, and he says, making those circles in prayer and continuing to pray over those specific needs that we may have been praying for a while now. God invites us to, to keep asking of, from Him. He invites us to ask of God. That's what we see in this very text. And Now I get the very extreme that when sometimes we come to God and it's like we make this to-do list and, and begin to treat God as some kind of like Santa Claus or vending machine or something. But, but while highlighting one extreme, we shouldn't throw out the baby with the bathwater. The scriptures invite us to ask of God. It's okay to come to Him and to ask Him questions, to, to ask Him to, to come and answer our needs. We see even in, in the very, you know, scriptures an invitation to even ask for the daily bread, right? Now, of course, there's, there's a extreme where we begin to make the gifts over the very giver, over God Himself. But then we shouldn't throw out the baby with the bathwater. It's okay to ask of God, whether it's for our daily bread or, or simply even for the gifts of the Spirit. The Scriptures tells us that, that we are to even yearn for the gifts of the Spirit. And maybe we can, we can even come to God and say, God, what, what does that even mean? Right? What does it mean to yearn for the gifts of the Spirit? And we, it, but in, in another passage, we can see that sometimes we actually do not have because we do not ask. And so one of the things that I see being highlighted in this very scripture is for us to not lose heart in the very even persistency in coming to God. We see through the revelation of scripture that those who knock the door will be opened. This is a promise from God. Those that seek will find answers. Those that ask will receive answers. And one thing that I find really interesting in this specific context is the very call to keep drawing near to God. And sometimes it might actually seem like God is silent. But I believe that part of even drawing to God in prayer is not only about asking specific things, although it's okay to do so, as we already highlighted that the, the scriptures themselves invite us to ask of God, but sometimes coming to God might actually look like some messy prayers at times. Where we can't even put the right words together to express how we feel. And if, if, if we look at even the prayers recorded in, in Psalms and all throughout the Bible, sometimes we might come to God with a prayer that sounds more kind of like even a lamenting kind of prayer. 
where we might even cry out and say, God, where are you? God, I'm going through pain right now. God, do you see what's happening to, to this individual being taken advantage of or, or whatever the issue may be? Sometimes our prayers might sound like that. And we see the very model from, uh, or the scriptures modeling that kind of prayer to us, even in Psalms. And then we later we even see Jesus quoting that psalm. Now he knows how that psalm ends. He, many people around there may know how that psalm ends, but he still cries out to God and says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You know, sometimes along the journey, we might find ourselves in situations where God just seems like he's far away, like, like he's answering other people's prayers. But sometimes we might feel like our prayers are not answered. But I would just like to encourage us that even in those moments, let us just draw near to God. At times, we might feel so much pain that, that instead of words, maybe all we have are even groans. But even there, God hears the cry of each and everybody's heart. God transcends even the very cultural norm of, of language that we use to communicate with each other. God is beyond whatever cultural norm we have. Even the very language that we use to communicate with each other, God is beyond that. He's beyond that very language. He understands every cry of the heart. Even before we find the right words to say, God knows exactly what we're going through. Which I would just like to invite us to, to come to God with, with authenticity, with the way we are, with just open completely before God. And, and, and we see that God is not afraid of even when we're angry at times. God's not afraid of that. Even in those moments, He invites us to keep coming to God. Maybe at times through the prayers, it might feel like sometimes it's like a, a mundane kind of feels just like a ritual. Our emotions are not in there. Even in those moments, God invites us to draw near to him. He's not offended by that. It's the very act to get up and just even draw near to God. And in this very parable, we see two big themes that are highlighted in, in, in all of Luke's even writing that we see there. And um, which essentially they, they, they reflect what uh, Luke writes in, in, in his uh, uh, gospel account and in the book of Acts. And so I, for one, I would encourage, even as we read the scriptures, to see how any particular verse that we even read, like how does that relate to, to the book as a whole? How does it relate to the scriptures as a whole? And as, as we take a look at this very parable, um, some of the major themes, or two of the major themes that I would like to, to highlight here is, for one, that, that, that prayer is being highlighted in this specific uh, parable, which happens to be, a, a big theme that Luke writes about all throughout his writing. From he, Luke mentions prayer more than any other New Testament writer. From from uh, the, the uh, Gospel of Luke to to the Book of Acts, and, and here we see that uh, persistency in prayers is one of the very types of, of prayers that are, are being. Uh, highlighted here in other words for us to just keep drawing near to God and the other major theme that's being highlighted here is is that God hears the cry of the oppressed we could see this all throughout Luke's writings that uh, what some theologians would actually highlight or, 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 or they they call it the great reversal in other words where the last are becoming first, the first are becoming last, uh, the humble are being uplifted, the, the proud are being brought low, uh, how the love of God is, is, is for all, uh, the love of God is for the outcast of the society, the marginalized of the society, the poor, the crippled, the tax collectors and sinners, the, for, for the Samaritans and, and the Gentiles, and even people like you and I. That is, is a big theme that we see throughout Luke's writings, and including the book of Acts as well. And what we see in this very parable, and one of the ways that, that Luke highlights the very heartbeat of God, is that God hears the cry of the oppressed. One of the characteristics of who God is, is that he hears the cry of the oppressed. 
I love how the, uh, uh, this one uh, Messianic Jewish Bible scholar helped uh, point out this, this point even more to me, even through some of the Old Testament writings. Uh, when we look at the story of Exodus and even the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. He highlights that, that, that one of the main principles that's being highlighted there is that God hears the cry of the oppressed. His first and foremost concern is to come and to redeem and rescue those that are under oppression, that are, that are being oppressed, whether it's by the society as a whole or, or whatever it may be. That's the, the first and foremost concern of God. Now, yes, there is a, a consequence to the oppressor, but the, the first and foremost primary uh, principle being highlighted there in those even stories is that God hears the cry of the oppressed. And something I ask myself is, what's the main principle that I highlight when I read those stories? Do I focus more on the mercy of God or the judgment of God? And does my emphasis reflect the heartbeat of God? I think this widower, to whatever degree, represents these very disciples. And and, and in a greater picture of things, I would say, this widow, or to whatever degree, even represents the church as a whole. As we grow in our relationship with Christ, we too begin to embody the very heartbeat of God more and more. And, and I believe one of the works of, of the Holy Spirit himself that he does within our hearts is he begins to fill us with a love and a compassion for the hurting souls, for, for the lost, for the oppressed. And, and just as God hears the cry of the oppressed, we too begin to hear that cry and we begin to respond when we see someone in pain, whether that's within our church family or even beyond the four walls of the church, I believe God calls us to be the hands and feet of Jesus. And then, in, and in this very context, Jesus is telling his disciples to not lose heart. As the Spirit begins to work upon their hearts, and essentially as the Spirit is working upon our hearts, there may begin to be a cry for justice that begins to arise in our hearts as well. When we see some individuals being taken advantage of, when we see the church in, in, in persecution or, or persecution on the rise, whether it's, it's, you know, in other countries or even here in the West, we begin to get a cry for justice. We begin to cry out to God about these very issues and, and God invites us to draw near to him. God invites us to ask of him. God invites us to partner with him in rescuing those that are oppressed, those that are in pain, those that are in bondage, to, to begin to partner with God, walking with him, not just doing things for him, but walking with him and having the heartbeat of God to go and bring deliverance to those that are in pain, those that are in bondage. And, and as we do, we begin to embody the very heartbeat of God himself. And as we begin to pray these very requests, we are praying according to the will of God and, and God will answer and God will help us in his right timing. And as the church, at times, we might feel like the widower. You know, in the original context where this is written, uh, the, 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 the husbands even more so serve to protect uh, their wives in that original context. And so as this widower is being uh, uh, mentioned to the original audience, they, can, they see this widower as someone who's completely defenseless may very well have no one else to even churn to accept this very unrighteous judge. And, and, and at times as we see persecution on the rise in our world, whether through, through other countries or here in the West, although the church sometimes might feel like the widower, we are invited by God himself to, to call upon the name of the Lord, to draw near to him. And we know that our groom is coming soon. We may hear of wars and, and rumors of wars, but I just want to encourage us to not fear. The world might fear, but, but you know, as, as we hear of all sorts of, you know, wars or rumors of wars, but, but the church, we as the church, we say, come Lord Jesus. 
Your church awaits. Your bride awaits. And at times, yes, we might feel like the widower. We might experience even moments as the early disciples did, as, as, as Jesus is getting arrested, right? After they followed, they're following Jesus for three years or so, and all of a sudden, this very individual who they've seen as the Messiah is getting arrested. All of a sudden, he's being taken away from them and thrown into the courtyard. All of a sudden, they're sentencing him to a criminal's death all of a sudden they're they're torturing him all of a sudden they're putting him on the cross and all of a sudden they put him in the grave but I just want to remind us one more time that our Jesus did not stay in that grave our Jesus did not stay on that cross he rose again and he came back for his disciples and I just want to remind us today that our Jesus is coming back for us our Jesus is coming back for his, his bride and, and he's coming back and he is the Lord of Lords. And even in the darkest hours of our lives, we can call upon Jesus knowing that he hears the cry of the oppressed. He hears the cry of those that are in pain, those that are going through persecution. He hears our cry. He hears the cry of the mothers and, and the fathers that are praying over their sons and daughters. He hears that cry. And he welcomes us to ask of him. He welcomes us to draw near to him, to keep coming to him no matter what. And church, that's simply just encouragement that I want to just share with us today. That, that, that maybe even if some of us might find ourselves in a situation where we have not yet received that answer where we have not yet received the, the fulfillment of the very promise that was given to us. Let's keep drawing near to him. Let's keep praying those bold prayers. Some of those prayers that we've been praying for a while now. Let us not lose heart. Let us continue to pray persistently, coming and drawing near to God, whether that's asking of Him, whether that's even uh, writing out a prayer journal, a lamenting prayer journal, where our cries, we're just weeping, whatever it may be. There was times in my life where I had no words to say, but, but just tears and just crying out to God. But then God reveals Himself. God begins to speak His word over our lives, over our souls, and we begin to find rest in his presence that even in the times of waiting and we allow God to perfect the work that he has started in us yes there's there's at times there's a maybe even a promise given through a prophetic message or whatever it may be but there might be some time that it takes to uh, cultivate that promise to develop in, in a, a lot of times before God even fulfills a particular promise he begins to cultivate our character in order for our character to sustain that very promise of God and so I just don't want us even to allow any, any pain to go to waste in the very moments, in, 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 in the mundane moments that uh, at times we, we, we just don't even feel like praying. At times where, where it's just such pain to just not allow the, the painful moments to go to waste, but allow God to perfect the work that he has started in us, perfect the character that he wants to build in us in order to sustain that very promise that comes. And there's many different situations that we might find ourselves in. And I just invite us to just keep drawing near to God. And you know, sometimes in, in, in prayer, as we draw near to Him, it might even look like just sitting in His presence in silence and just allowing Him to love on us. Just, just even in, in, in some of our prayers, that even if we could just reach that very moment where we could hear the Father's voice speaking over us, saying, this is my Son in whom I am well pleased. For this is my daughter in whom I am well pleased. That in and of itself already fixes so much problems that we tend to just face throughout life. You know, and sometimes me, myself, being, you know, in, in the preaching kind of ministry and stuff, and I might come in prayer and I'm just saying all kinds of things, and I just need to remind myself at times to just, just sit in silence and prayer and just allow God to love on me. Allow God to just fill me with his love, with his compassion, and then I begin to be filled with this love and compassion for others that may be going through pain and difficulties. And so that's my encouragement to us today, church. And I would just like to close off in prayer, and, and, and maybe there's somebody in here that, that's been praying some, some prayers that, that, that 
just have not been answered yet. And, and maybe some of those prayers even hurt to mention. And, and, and I just want us to, to just be really real with God, even in this very prayer, just to open up our heart to him and, 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 and really share with him what it is that is on our heart. You know, we, could, we can go ahead and stand in, in, in the presence of God, whoever's able to stand, and just open our hearts before him. You know, sometimes we, you know, sometimes I myself might, might, might want to look good and, 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 and look like this, you know, instantaneous kind of like faith-filled preacher that I'm going to just pray right now and somebody's going to be healed, you know. And sometimes in the church we might, we might kind of uh, begin to highlight that aspect a little bit more and we might miss that very aspect how, how even Pastor Vasily mentioned that sometimes before the fulfillment of the very promise, the very seed needs to first die. And it might seem like, where's the fruit? The fruit's not there. And, and, and I just want to encourage us that, that, that God's promise did not fail. It, 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 the seed is just buried. The answer doesn't mean that it's a no. It might just be a not yet. And, 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 and we just wait for that seed to blossom and we cultivate the ground and continue to pray. And, 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 and I just invite us to be real with God. God already knows what we're going through. There's no need to, to, to pretend we're somebody else, but let's, let's just draw near to Him as we are and be really just real with Him. Let us pray. Father, I uplift every individual here in this place. You know exactly who this word was speaking to, God. I thank you for even in reminding me through this very message to just draw near to you. Whether I have the words to express what I might be even feeling or going through, you invite me, you invite us to draw near to you. Whether that's just sitting in silence in prayer. Sometimes we want to do all the talking, but, but sometimes you just ask us to, to just listen, just to, to be in your presence, just to sit at your feet. Lord, forgive us whenever we, through the hurry of life, we just forgot to just simply sit in your presence and allow you to speak over our hearts. Allow your spirit to testify to our spirit. Lord, would you breathe upon us? Would you breathe a, a, a fresh wind of refreshment over every individual here in this place? You know, the individuals who've been praying for, for some of their lost relatives, whether that be even sons or daughters, or, or even praying over their parents, God. pray that you strengthen every prayer warrior here in this place. And would you, God, just come and even just simply, just as the disciples ask you to teach them how to pray, God, we just, we come to you, we draw near to you right now, and, and we just ask you, Lord, would you teach us how to pray? Would you teach us how to be people of prayer, people of fellowship with you, that don't just read about you, that don't just talk about you, but that encounter the living presence, the living God that is here in this room right now, God. You are, you are here. You are here right now, God. But would you awaken our hearts, quicken our hearts to, to be uh, aware of your presence, God. And even as we leave the four walls of this church, God, help us walk in such a way that embodies the heartbeat of God. As we begin to cry out for those that are oppressed, maybe the churches, some of the churches that are in persecution, some of the individuals who may be uh, facing hate at, at work for being Christian or, or, or even just generally under a, a difficult boss or whatever may be, whatever uh, kind of even uh, oppression that, 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 that uh, comes from the oppressor, even from, from the, uh, areas in the school or, or, or work or from the governmental field. God, whatever it may be, Lord, 
strengthen us, strengthen your church, strengthen those individuals. You know them by name, God. You know those individuals by name who are praying over some other individuals and, 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 and maybe some didn't even want to mention their names because it hurt so much. Maybe at times some even here feel awkward to mention certain prayer uh, requests because they've been saying them so often in prayer circles and they still haven't been fulfilled yet. I pray, we pray over them right now in the mighty name of Jesus that the word that you've spoken over their lives comes to fulfillment that you strengthen each and every individual in the time of waiting. And one more time, Lord, we just say, come, Lord Jesus, your bride awaits. To you be the glory.